Here in Japan, it's a Saturday night. I'm James Tengan in Tokyo. Welcome to Newsline. Efforts to find people missing in landslides in western Japan have entered their fourth day. Police in Hiroshima say 46 people died when slopes gave way on Wednesday during heavy rain. 41 others are missing or unaccounted for. About 3,000 police officers, firefighters and self-defense force personnel have been taking part in the search. But their efforts are being hampered by mud and debris. The work is difficult. In some places, we can't move our legs because of the sticky mud. The rescuers have brought in several pieces of heavy equipment to help them remove debris more quickly. About 650 households remain without electricity. More than 1,700 people are still in shelters, many of them elderly. I wake up at 3 or 4 and cannot go back to sleep. You get bone tired as things drag on like this. People from across the country have volunteered to assist the recovery efforts. They're helping to remove mud from homes and pick up debris. It might be quicker to use machines, but in some places we can probably only use our hands. I hope I can help in some way. I'm truly grateful. There's still lots of work to do. Heavy rain is expected in some areas of Hiroshima through Saturday night. Officials are warning residents to stay alert for more landslides. Officials in Washington have lodged a protest with China over the near collision of two military aircraft. They say a Chinese pilot flew dangerously close to a U.S. plane. Defense Department officials say the Chinese aircraft was a J-11 fighter. They say it came within 10 meters of a U.S. Navy P-8 patrol plane on Tuesday over the South China Sea. We have registered our strong concerns to the Chinese about the unsafe and unprofessional intercept, which posed a risk to the safety and the well-being of the air crew uh, and was inconsistent with customary international law. Kirby said the incident took place about 215 kilometers east of Hainan Island. In 2001, a U.S. military jet and a Chinese fighter plane collided in the same area. Pentagon officials say the latest incident is one of the most dangerous since then. Chinese military jets flying over the East China Sea have repeatedly approached Japan's self-defense forces aircraft. That has led Japanese officials to lodge their own protests. Dozens of people have been killed in Iraq after militants opened fire on a Sunni mosque. The attack occurred during Friday prayers. Police believe the attack was carried out by Shia militants. It occurred in the village of Imam Weiss, about 120 kilometers northeast of Baghdad. Reuters news agency says 68 people died. Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki announced last week that he would resign. Maliki is a Shia. He's faced growing criticism that his pro-Shia agenda has provoked Sunni militants to launch attacks in the country. Some Sunnis have started to show signs that they're ready to work with the new government under Prime Minister-designate Haider al-Abadi. But the latest killings may undermine Abadi's attempts to form a national unity government. Members of the UN Security Council have called for the defeat of the militant group that beheaded American journalist James Foley. They say the killers are terrorists who must be brought to justice. The council issued a statement after holding talks on the group Islamic State. They say Foley's murder demonstrates the brutality of the militants. They're also calling on the group and others associated with al-Qaeda to unconditionally release all hostages. A British newspaper has shed light on the identity of the militant who beheaded Foley. It says the man is thought to be a UK citizen. The Guardian says one of its sources identified the killer. The former hostage said the man is intelligent, educated and a devout believer in radical Islamic teachings. The Guardian quotes a linguistics expert as saying the militant sounds as though he's from London. It says British police are analyzing the video. United Nations officials have disclosed the scale of killing in the conflict in Syria. They say the number of deaths exceeds 190,000. UN human rights officials identified people killed since the Assad administration began cracking down on anti-government protesters. 
They say the number from March 2011 to April this year stood at 191,369. The total has actually together more than doubled uh, the number documented uh, a year ago, which we announced in, in June 2013. The UN officials say Damascus has the highest number of casualties. Estimates put it at over 39,000. They say the next highest figures are for the northern city of Aleppo and the central city of Homs. Around 8,800 victims were under the age of 19. UN staff based their estimates on information from the Syrian government and human rights groups. They counted every case where they had confirmed the victim's name and the place and time of death. They say the actual number is probably far higher. The Ukrainian government has strongly rebuked Russia. It's protesting the dispatch of scores of trucks and a controversial aid convoy to East Ukraine's rebel-held area. Kiev called Friday's move an invasion. The Russian government last week dispatched 280 trucks carrying relief supplies. But they were stopped at the border for over a week by Ukrainian officials. The Russians criticized Ukraine for sabotaging its efforts to help residents. The convoy was ordered to move on to Luhansk without obtaining permission from Ukraine's government. Russian media have reported that all the trucks reached the city without being caught in any crossfire. In a telephone conversation with German Chancellor Angela Merkel, Russian President Vladimir Putin defended the action. He said Russia could no longer wait for Ukraine's permission amid concerns of a growing humanitarian crisis. A White House official said the dispatch required the consent of the Ukrainian government as well as an escort by officials of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, Russia should uh, take the opportunity to remove uh, this convoy from within Ukraine. Uh, if they don't, uh, they will face uh, additional costs and consequences. UN Secretary General Pan Ki moon said in a statement that he's deeply concerned about the situation. He's urged both sides to use restraint and cooperate so that the humanitarian aid can reach those who need it. Authorities with the World Health Organization say more time is needed to bring the Ebola outbreak under control. They say it will likely take six to nine months the epidemic has killed about 1,400 people, mostly in West Africa. We expect several months of very hard work. We expect several months of really struggling against this outbreak. But again, we expect to turn it around at some point. Fukuda held talks with government officials in Liberia. The country has been hit hardest by the disease. He said WHO workers will help make sure that more patients receive proper treatment. Officials at the organization are scheduled to release a strategy plan for combating the outbreak. It will include details about specific programs and the funding necessary to carry them out. On a much lighter note, visitors to a resort in central Japan are being treated to a special summer site. A field of sunflowers is in full bloom. The field in Nagano Prefecture boasts about 14,000 flowers, all planted by schoolchildren. It's so beautiful. I didn't expect to see so many sunflowers. I'm really happy. Local officials plan to give away seeds to visitors as soon as they're ready for harvest. And that was our news roundup for this hour. I'm James Tengon in Tokyo. We end with the extended world weather forecast. NHK World, so stay right where you are. Due to Japan's immensely varied landscape and climate, 
this island nation developed unique cultural traditions. Many of these are world-renowned, but many more remain hidden away deep in the countryside. The best way to discover these secret places, the real Japan, is to go exploring by bicycle. In this edition of Cycle Around Japan, we are going to cycle through the Izu Peninsula. We'll make our trip in spring, when the mountains of Izu are brilliant green and flowers are blooming everywhere. Our trip will take us to the foothills of Mount Fuji, recently recognized as a world heritage. We'll travel through a fertile and prosperous landscape created by the unique geography of this area and its famous mountain. Through mountain forests, sometimes in driving rain, Sometimes in pleasant sea breezes, our trip will cover 160 kilometers. We'll ride through spectacular scenery, relax in hot springs, and best of all, meet many smiling faces. Join us on this trip to see a side of Japan that you won't find in the guidebooks. This special express on the Izuku line runs from Tokyo down to the tip of the Izu Peninsula. On board this train,